183. Kenosis, the great modern heresy. Calcedon Position Paper, number 45, December 1983. The doctrine of kenosis is something rarely mentioned in our time, but its evil influence is overwhelmingly pervasive in this century. The doctrine has deep roots in Eastern Orthodox churches, especially Russian. In the 19th century, it became influential in Lutheranism through the writings of Sartorius, 1832-1834, of Koenig in 1844, and Tomasius, 1845. It then moved into English and American theological thought. Its supposed foundation is in Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 to 8, where Paul speaks of Christ's great step from the Godhead into the Incarnation. This the canonic thinkers interpreted to mean that Christ emptied himself of all power and thereby set a pattern for self-abasement by all his followers. Nadezhda Garadetsky, in The Humiliated Christ in Modern Russian Thought, 1938, wrote of the canonic mind, mood or character of Russian religion and its emphasis on self-abasement, poverty, non-resistance, and the submissive acceptance of suffering and death. Garajetsky commented, It even seems to us that the main importance of Russian canonicism lies precisely in the fact that there was no doctrine about it. It had become the true way of piety and life. The life of the redeemed, according to this belief, is one of self-humiliation and self-abasement, the goal is a world without rich men, superiors or success. The idea of the medieval begging friars is held out as the goal of all true Christianity. Only of those who are abandoned by all in poverty and sickness can it be said that they alone are sons of Christ and have full rights to beg in his almighty name. As in pre-Marxist Russia, so today in Western Europe and the United States, the doctrine of kenosis is no longer a formal doctrine, but is equated with the Christian life. The popular assumption is that a Christian should be, as one unbeliever summed it up, the all-American patsy, sucker or victim. Some years ago, a woman whose life had been dedicated to destroying people first as a beauty and then as a manipulator, turned on me when I blocked her evil ways, declaring I was obviously not a Christian. Why? Because a Christian is someone who never hurts anyone's feelings. The Christian is expected to be the victim, the ready pacifist in every situation who believes in peace at any price. This doctrine has penetrated far and wide and has become a part of Western culture, Christian and non-Christian. Its tenets are basic to the so-called peace movement and they undergird the thinking of R.J. Sider and others like him. The Russian doctrine of kenosis, as it moved westward, found a congenial soil in Western Protestant and Catholic pietism. Certainly John Wesley, especially in his marital life, despite the symptoms of canotic surrender and self-abasement. The direction of this way of life revealed itself all too clearly in some of the Russian mystical and heretical sects, such as the Klisti and the Skopsi. The Skopsky carried the required self-humiliation to the point of castration. Moreover, just as the Sicarii of ancient Judea, if anyone expressed interest in their beliefs, would kidnap him and forcibly circumcise him. So the Skopsky would kidnap and perform more radical surgery on anyone who appeared friendly, and sometimes on others as well. Frederick C. Conybeer, Russian Dissenters, 1921, page 369. These extreme cases serve as an indicator of the direction of canonic thinking. It is suicidal. 
whereas Christ identifies himself as life, John chapter 14, verse 6, and declares, I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. John chapter 10, verse 10. Kenosis offers a retreat from life, which is, implicitly, suicide. Given the saturation of the Western world by canonic thought, it should not surprise us that we have today the politics and economics of suicide. Vast sums of money are appropriated by the United States and loaned by US and European banks to, quote, third world, end quote, countries. These funds do not reach the peoples. They prop up corrupt and evil regimes. They hinder growth and production in those countries. And these funds are creating a worldwide inflation which is destroying economics, money, men, and nations. The press gives us many reports of this worldwide crisis. The result? Suicide. This is the prescription of the sons of Kenosis. Whether in the sphere of economics, politics, international conflicts, or more, this suicidal faith is undergirded by popular religion. Many atheists, modernists, and fundamentalists may disagree extensively on a wide variety of ideas and issues, but they are agreed on one essential point. The need for self-abasement, non-resistance, poverty, and the acceptance of suffering and death. Indeed, much pastoral counselling of troubled and afflicted people is canotic. Its one, quote, wisdom, end quote, is submission to evil. Is your husband beating you, or is he guilty of incest? Is your wife or husband flagrantly unfaithful? Your problem is your anger or grief over this. Go back and be more loving and submissive. So runs the counsel of defeat, of surrender to evil. Suicide is, after all, a form of surrender, and surrender has been ennobled by canonic thought into a higher way of life. The quote-unquote real Christian is someone who lies down to be walked over. The quote-unquote real liberal is someone whose trumpet always sounds retreat. Leo Tolstoy, a great exponent of the canonic way of life, had a major convert in Gandhi. Gandhi found the doctrine an admirable way of playing on the weakness of the West. He shed his top hat and suit for a loincloth and pacifism to shame Western liberals with their own tacit religion. It should be remembered, however, that Gandhi also said, Where there is only a choice between cowardice and violence, I would advise violence. Cited by Arthur Waskar, The Freedom Seeder, 1969, page 52. Western civilization has so deeply identified itself with kenosis as a way of life that it gives aid, technology and food to nations bent on its destruction and also with a glow of virtue. It rejoices at every opportunity for preparing its own funeral. The great Russian novelist of the last century, Turgenev, in his poems and prose, described his stop in a humble village church. Although not a believer, he spoke of having a vision of Christ, and Christ looked like a peasant and had a face like that of all others. The Apostle John, however, tells us that when he saw in vision the ascended Christ, in awe he fell at his feet as dead. Revelation chapter 1 verse 17 He was not looking at an ordinary peasant face, it is, however, customary now to portray Christ as a very ordinary person, somewhat more effeminate than most men. All this is forgetting that he is very God of very God. The visual depictions of Christ have for some generations been canonic. He is not shown as the Lord of glory, but as a plaintive beseecher who wants us to love him. The, quote, ideal, end quote, canonic Christian life was sought by St. Tikhon, Bishop of Vorance, Timofey S. Sokolov, 1724-1783, canonized in 1861. St. Tikhon 
represented the ideal which Dostoevsky tried to portray in his novels, and Dostoevsky was not alone among Russian writers in his admiration for St. Tikhon. That Tikhon was concerned with the plight of the poor, sold the silk, velvet and furs belonging to him as a bishop to give to the poor, lived very, very simply and helped generously, indeed marked him as a Christian man of grace and charity. But St. Tikhon went further. In an argument with the landlord, the landlord, in place of any good response, struck St. Tikhon in the face. Bishop Tikhon fell on his knees, prostrated himself before the landlord, and asked his pardon for having induced him into temptation. Garajetsky, page 102. Such behaviour, in a canonic culture, gains great admiration. However, it does not change men, nor abolish slums. Moreover, St. Tikhon said, Christ is begging through the poor, page 105. This is a common identification in contemporary liberation theology. The body of Christ is identified with the poor, not with the faithful. The result is a profoundly false distortion of Christianity. That scripture requires us to be mindful of the poor is very clear. That God regards widows and orphans and uses our treatment of them as a barometer is obvious. That Christ in the parable of judgment, Matthew chapter 25 verses 31 to 46, identifies himself with his poor, imprisoned and needy members is most emphatically true. But he does not say that he identifies himself with poverty as such, or with the poor as such, nor with a masochistic self-abasement. In approaching men and nations, the spirit of canonic faith has certain emphases. First, there must be a self-abasement. As with St. Tikhon and the landlord, we must see ourselves as in the wrong, and the other person is right. There is a pharisaical pride and virtue in self-abasement. Thus, we and our nation must always be seen as the offenders. Second, this canonic submissiveness to evil requires us to downgrade the sins of men and nations. As a Russian leader, Father John, John Ilyich Tseryev, the predecessor to Rasputin in the Russian court, said, Love every man in spite of his falling into sin. Never mind the sins. John Ilyich Tseryev, My Life in Christ, 1897, page 95. Or, as a pastor said to a wife whose husband was, to cite his lesser sin, flagrantly adulterous, Never mind your husband's sins. Let's concentrate on your duty to love him and to be submissive. Neither should we concentrate on or discuss the sins of Soviet Russia. We should only concern ourselves with our own sins. Canotic submissiveness requires a self-blinding to reality. Third, again to cite Father John, Never mind the sins, but remember that the foundation of the man is the same, the image of God. Ibid. A common humanity is to be stressed, not the fact of sin, nor how to deal with the problems it creates. However, when men obscure the sin, they also obscure the answer. It is sin which is the barrier between men and God, and between men and men. Kenosis depreciates everything it touches, as do all false doctrines. Moreover, kenosis creates a false antithesis. Every erroneous faith presents men with a false antithesis. We have seen Gandhi's view of the antithesis, cowardice versus violence. The problem is that each produces the other. Moreover, the antithesis to cowardice is courage, not violence. It is a strange mind that sees it as violence but it is a mind too much in evidence today. 
The canonic advocates of a nuclear freeze and unilateral disarmament present us also with a false antithesis. On the one hand is peace, seen as pacifism and surrender, and on the other hand, world destruction. A false antithesis is one which creates false alternatives in order to compel us to choose a priority and course. Such an antithesis fails to note that a large variety of options exist between surrender and world destruction. To see the options as only better red than dead, or better dead than red, is an insanity, and a common one. Kenosis involves a radical and childish solution to the problems of life. Instead of faith, the works of faith, patience, a slow development over the generations, and the use of as many instruments as possible to solve man's problems, Kenosis wants an instant solution by means of surrender, defeat, abasement, and self-inflicted poverty. Faith and work are replaced by dramatic gestures and postures, and intelligence is supplanted by picket slogans. As the doctrine of kenosis came westward, it merged commonly with Protestant and Catholic pietism. These had prepared the way for kenosis with their emphasis on a mindless religion. In France, Madame Guillaume, 1648 to 1717, had been a major source of quietism. She believed that the essence of true faith is an act of resignation and submission to God in which the believer is without words, without actions, and without any will of his own, and then thereby without sin. The role of such thinking in preparing the way for the French Revolution deserves exploring. An atmosphere of surrender and submission was created precisely in those circles where a strong moral will and resistance were most needed. Certainly, Louis XVI was amazingly derelict in manifesting a stance of unresisting submission to the progressive demolition of France. Kenosis, as we have seen, is a way of life common to churchmen and to unbelievers, and it is common to a variety of religions in the modern world. Its advocates take various Bible verses out of context to justify their position, but they are substantially and essentially at odds with Scripture. Kenosis has so thoroughly permeated our time that it has ceased to exist as a known doctrine. It is now a part of the intellectual air which all men breathe. That air, however, is deadly, because the canonic mindset is suicidal. The canonic plan of salvation by works of kenosis is a way of death. As Solomon said, setting forth the word of the Lord, He that sinneth against me wrongeth his own soul. All they that hate me love death. Proverbs chapter 8 verse 36 God's true antithesis still stands. See, I have sent before thee this day life and good, and death and evil. Therefore choose life, that both thou and thy seed may live. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 15 and 19.